Hello everyone. Oh, we made one big row. That's a good idea. Yeah, so we can all sit together. Okay, so let's sit down. We're going to get started. We are up to week... Man, it's been 15 weeks already. Can you guys believe that? So many weeks. Oh, we have to go huh? Wow. So remember you have to... Twin. What do you want to do if you want to talk? Do you remember the rules? Ah, see? Okay, so let's start with prayer like we always do. We're running a little bit late this morning, but it's okay. We'll try and catch up. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here and pray that the children will enjoy the story and help us, Lord, as well to have fun uh, at the games later as well. So we thank you and praise you uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, quick reminder, three rules. Sit quietly. Yeah, that's one of them. Put your hand up if you want to talk. You've got to remember that one, right? <laughs> and pay attention when the bishop's talking. You guys are doing quite well. So thank you so much. Okay, book number 17. So we've done 15 weeks, but we're putting some books together. That's why we're up to, yeah, well, this is actually pronounced Esther. That's right. So how do you spell Easter? Easter has got an A in there, right? And you take away the H. Easter is a bit different. Easter's coming up. It's going to be next week, isn't it? This is Esther. So Esther is the name of a, of a lady in the Bible. And we're going to look at her story today. I've got some lot of pictures for you. This is an interesting story. So this is set at the time when they're in captivity. But now Babylon is not ruling anymore. Now it's the Medes and the Persians. There's two empires coming together to rule over the captive Israel. So Israel's captive. And we have the king here. I don't know if he's in this picture, actually. It's not the king. This probably looks a bit like Haman a bit later on. But the story starts where... It's such an interesting story, Esther. How many of you are familiar with the story, Esther? You are? Hopefully I tell the story good for you guys. I'll try and recount it as much as I can from the top of my memory with the pictures I have here. So you know where the story starts in Esther? Pay attention, girls. You know where the story starts in Esther? The king, he has a big feast. He has like a big party. People come over and he asks his wife to come to the party, Queen Vashti. But she doesn't, she doesn't want to come. No, she doesn't come. She doesn't listen to her husband. and She doesn't come to the party. So this is King Ahasuerus. You can tell because of his crown. Look at that fancy crown he's got. It's not like the one we made. It's kind of like a round crown. Somebody's drawn this. So he asked Queen Vashti to come to the party. She doesn't come. She disobeys her husband. So what does the king do? The king gets angry. that His wife did not obey him. So he gets together with his nobles and they say, if we do not punish Queen Vashti for disobeying the king, disobeying her husband, that's going to set a bad example through the kingdom. And maybe wives throughout the kingdom will no longer obey their husbands. So you see how it's very important, the example that we set as leaders. People are following our example, right, Simon? It's like if we're the oldest in our family, Fefi, you're going to be an example to your younger sister, just like you're an example to your younger siblings, right? Yes. You're going to be an example in the church to the younger siblings, right? So it doesn't always have, it's not always blood siblings, you always have to think about how you act. It's going to affect other people. So it's the same with Queen Vashti. She did a bad act, so she got punished. So she was removed from being queen. And they said, you know what? We're going to look through the land. And obviously this is not the right thing to do because you can't just put away your your wife but this is the unbelieving king we're talking about king of the Medes and the Persians not a righteous king so he says you know what I'm done with Queen Vashti she's going to be removed as queen and we're going to look throughout the land for a beautiful woman and then she's going to replace Queen Vashti as the queen so a decree gets spread out to say hey we are looking for a beautiful young lady to replace Queen Vashti. So they go around and they gather up these women that may be able to take Queen Vashti's place. And this is where Esther comes into the picture. 
Esther, from a little child, so maybe, you know, who knows how young she was, maybe as young as you guys, when she was really young, she, we don't know what happened to Esther's parents, but she was raised by her uncle. Who knows the name of her uncle? Do you remember the name? No? His name was Mordecai. And Mordecai was a very righteous man. And these people were Jews. They were God's people. Right? So they were believers back then. Now we are known as Christians. Back then they were known as Jews because of the nation they were from, Judah. So Mordecai raised Esther from a very young age. So when Esther, now she's a lady, she was chosen as part of all these ladies to go present herself to the king so the king could choose one lady to be the new queen. So Mordecai would be checking up on it. So eventually Esther is presented to the king amongst all the other ladies and she was actually the one chosen. So out of all the ladies that were presented to the king, the king found Esther to be the most pleasing to him. So he chose Esther to take Queen Vashti's place as the new queen. So you can see her there, she's being crowned as the new queen. So isn't it amazing that this Jewish lady raised by her uncle is now all of a sudden the queen of the king of the world back then. King of Medes and Persia, Ahasuerus. Now at the same time when, Vash, uh, when Esther now has replaced Queen Vashti, this is Mordecai, her uncle. So he's sitting at the gate of the city, you know, because that's where he would sit so he could keep an eye on Esther and see how well she's doing. Well, while he's sitting at the gate of the city, you know what he hears? He hears two people plotting to try and kill the king. What does that mean? They were making plans to think, you know what, we want to kill the king. They were evil, right? So Mordecai, he happens to be at, sitting at the gate. He overhears these people talking about this. So he warns the king. He tells people to go tell him. Mordecai sends a message. So the king finds out that these two guys are trying to kill him and then he sentences them for punishment. Basically sentences them to death. And this story of Mordecai saving the king is written down in the books of the kings as a record to say, hey, this is what happened. So Mordecai was recognized then as saving the king's life. Now the king didn't do anything about it at that point. So now we are introduced, do you know his name? Haman. Right, now Haman is known as the enemy of God's people, the enemy of the Jews. Now at this time, King Ahasuerus, he promoted Haman up to a very high position. Right? What does that mean? That means you make somebody very honoured in the kingdom. It's like one of his generals, one of his captains, one of his leaders. And Haman, what he wanted when he walked around, he wanted everyone to bow down to him. Now, we shouldn't bow down to men, should we? We only bow down to God. So what do you think Mordecai did when everybody else was bowing? Mordecai didn't bow. He stood nice and straight because he only bows to one. He only bows to God. And you know what? Haman, he hated that. He, he wanted to be worshipped by man. But Mordecai refused to do it. And you know what? Haman hated that. He hated Mordecai so much that he went to the king and he said, you know what, king? There is a people in our kingdom that they don't want to follow our rules. So now he's making up lies about these people, making lies about the Jews, saying there's this, these people in our kingdom, they don't want to follow our rules and who knows if one day they're going to rebel against you. So he says, you know what we should do with these people? Let's appoint a day where I'm going to hire a bunch of army people and we're going to kill them all. That's what he says. Now, because the king doesn't really know what he's talking about, he's trusting Haman at this point in time. He says, hey, that's a good idea. These, these people in my kingdom that are rebelling, man, we should make sure we get rid of them. But the problem is Haman was lying to him about them wanting to do those things. 
So about this time, it was the first month of the year. We don't know whether it's January or they go by a different calendar. But let's say for, for story's sake, it's January at this time of the year. So what they said is, well, in December, in the 12th month, on the 13th day of the month, so in our calendar, let's say that's the 13th of December, that's the day when we're going to hire this army and all the Jews throughout the land are going to get killed. So this writing is done and Haman seals it with the king's ring. That's kind of like the king saying, yep, let's do it. And this message goes throughout the land that the Jews are going to get killed on this particular day about 11 months later. So as the message goes out, what do you think the Jews are thinking? Ah! Now they're thinking like, this is terrible news that the king wants to kill us all. So back in those days when they would express how upset they were, you know what they would do? And I don't think you guys should do this, but when you're upset, but when they were upset, they rip their clothes. Arr, they rent their clothes to show that they were upset. So that's what Mordecai did. He rent his clothes. You know, and he's mourning in the city and at the gate. So he's standing, he's sitting at the gate of the city and people, you know, Esther sends people to say, hey, why, why is Mordecai, you know, mourning and his clothes are ripped. He sends clothes to put clothes on it and he's like, he's mourning because of that message that came out. So Mordecai tells the messenger of Esther, because Esther's in the palace now, right? Because she's the queen. So Mordecai, her uncle, sends a message to Esther saying, this is what Haman has done. Haman has set a plan in place and the king has signed it that one day we're all going to be killed. And he says to Esther, you have to do something about it, Esther, because you're right next to the king, you're the queen. Now Esther at first says, how, how can I do anything? I can't just go to the king, because back then, if you just go to the king, and he doesn't extend the golden scepter, so the king was holding a golden scepter, if he didn't hold it out when you went to him, then you'd be killed. So you risk coming into the king's inner court if you presented yourself and the king did not extend the golden scepter, which means he did not allow you to come in, then you would be taken off and killed. So this is what Esther sends back to Mordecai, saying, I can't just go and talk to the king because if he doesn't extend out the golden scepter, I'm going to be killed. You know, Mordecai hears the message from the messenger. So right now they're communicating by message, right? Because Mordecai can't just go into the palace to talk to Esther. So Mordecai writes back and basically says some of the famous words in the Bible. And we'll read it here in Esther. He says to her, or well, he writes to her in Esther chapter 4, verse 14b. So it's the second part of the chapter. He says, And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom, look at what he says, for such a time as this. So you know what he says to Esther? He says, you are the queen. And he says, who knows if God brought you to this place to be the queen so that you can save us from this terrible fate. Because, you know, Esther's scared about risking her life. And Mordecai says to her, maybe that's why God has you in that position. So you guys got to think of that too. Sometimes you'll come across a time in your life where you're in a situation where you're the only one that can do something. And if you don't do it, you know, it's like with Esther. Who knows whether you're in that position for that very moment that God needs you to do something. So that's what he writes about. Let's read it together. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 B. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So he writes back to Esther, that's what he says. And you know what Esther says? She, she says, you know, Mordecai's right. And she says, I want you guys to pray and fast. Fast means you don't eat anything for three days. 
And she says, you know, me and my maidens, my ladies, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pray and we're going to fast for three days as well. And she says, after three days, I'm going to go into the king. And she, she says, if I perish, I perish. She's risking her life. She says, if he doesn't extend out the golden scepter, so be it. I'm going to die. I risk my life to try and save the Jews. So after three days, Esther presents herself to the king. But thankfully, the king is pleased with Esther. You know, did God move his heart? Who knows? But when she presented herself to the king, the king extended the golden scepter and allowed Esther to be in his presence. So when Esther was in his presence, you know, she asked the king, King, I, I want to make a banquet for you. I want to make a, a, a party for you. I want to invite you along, but I also want to invite Haman along. Remember, Haman was the one that made the message that he wants to kill all the Jews. So she didn't tell King Ahasuerus at this point what her plan was. She just invited him to a party with Haman. Right? And he agrees. He says, yes, I will, I will come to that party. And you know what Haman hears about that he's invited to this party? And he's happy. He says, you know, it's, it's good I'm invited to this party. But you know what? He thinks about Mordecai. Whenever he walks past, everyone else is bowing to him, but not Mordecai. Mordecai bows to no man, only to God. He's a good example, isn't he? And you know what Haman says? He says, you know, I have so much power in the kingdom. I get invited to the nice parties, but he says, all of this means nothing to me when I see Haman not bowing down to me. Can you see how bad this man is? How, you know, he, he does not appreciate the other things he has. He's trying to get worship from man. And you know what him and his family say? They say, you know what? Why don't you build a big gallows for Haman and hang him on there? And he says, you know what? I think that's a good idea. So he builds, what's a gallows? A gallows is like a big thing where you hang people. That's how they die. So he built this huge gallows that he was going to kill Mordecai on. Right? And after they come up with that plan, right, then he goes to uh, the banquet. Now, before the banquet happens, we're told this story where, oh no, sorry, no, that's not when the banquet happens. This is when he comes up with the plan to kill, to kill Haman. Now, this is such an interesting story, isn't it? I think it's a very interesting story. <laughs> now we get to King Haman, uh, King Ahasuerus. He's sleeping in the night and he can't sleep. Have you ever had that where you're trying to sleep at night and you can't sleep? Rolling and turning, can't sleep. So he says, you know what, he asks his servants, come and I want to hear some stories out of the books of the Chronicles of the Kings. All right? So it's like, I want to, maybe a bedtime story will help. You know, sometimes when you can't sleep, maybe a bedtime story helps, helps you get to sleep. Same with the king. Even though he's the king of the land, he wants a bedtime story. So they read this story from the Chronicles of the Book of the Kings, and you know the story that they read? The story that they read is the story of Mordecai saving the king. Do you remember? Back at the beginning, I'll go all the way back there. Remember when Mordecai was at the gate and he heard about the two people plotting and then after he saved the king, it was written in the book but the king forgot about it. So now when he's struggling to sleep, the king says, hey, I want to hear some stories out of the book of the Chronicles of the Kings and they read about Mordecai learning about these people trying to kill the king and be him being saved because of it. And the king says, you know what? Did we, did we ever do anything for Mordecai? You know, he saved my life. Did I, I ever do anything nice for him? Give him a gift, anything? They're like, well, no. So he says, you know what? I'm going I'm to do something nice for Mordecai. So the next day, Haman comes in <laughs> to, to see the king. And the king's thinking, how am I going to reward Mordecai? So he asks Haman, he says to Haman, Haman, what should I do to the man that the king delights to honour? You know, I want to honour somebody. What should I do to him? 
And Haman, being the self-centered man that he is, he thinks, well, who else is the king going to honor besides me? He's going to honor me. So Haman says, you know what? This is what you should do to the man you want to honor. Why don't you let him wear your crown, king's crown. Let him wear the king's robe. Put the man on the king's horse and take that man, get somebody to take that man around and whoever you get to take the man around, he's going to ring a bell saying, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Because he thinks that's going to happen to him. You know what happens? The king says, you know what? Do that to Mordecai. And you're going to be the one taking him around saying, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Now, can you imagine how Haman felt at that point? He hates Mordecai, but now... So this is when he's saying, hey, this is what should be done to him. He's thinking it's him. And then the king says, you know what? Do that to Mordecai. And look at his face. He's like, because he hates Mordecai. But he had to do it, right? Because he was told by the king. So now Haman is taking Mordecai with the crown and the king's robe on the king's horse. And he's the one going through the city saying, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. Isn't that funny how God works things out? Now, he was not happy about that at all. So he went home, he told his wife, he says, I can't believe I had to do this for Mordecai, the Jew that I hate so much. And then, after that happens, they go to the banquet that Esther invited the king to. Remember the banquet that, that Esther invited the king to? Now, at this banquet... This is when Esther tells the king that there is this evil plot to kill her people, to kill the Jews. And the king says to Esther, who wants to kill your people? Who is this evil man? And then Esther says to the king, it's Haman. So that's when the king finds out Oh, the plan that you had me kill these rebellious people that weren't really rebellious was actually my, the people of my queen. So the king storms out angry. I can't believe Haman does this. So when the king went out, Haman went to the queen begging, saying, please spare me my life. And that's when the king came back in. And the king sees Haman, obviously pulling on his wife and touching his wife, and he says, you've got this evil plan and now you're trying to force my wife to sleep with you? That's what he perceived, right? So then he took Haman away and said, you know, execute him. And you know what? The gallows, the gallows that Haman built for Mordecai, guess what? That's how he was killed, right, Simon? He was hanged on the gallows. He was hanged on the gallows. So you remember when he wanted to be honored by the king, he had to honor Mordecai. He wanted to kill Mordecai. Mordecai ended up, uh, sorry, Haman ended up getting killed on the gallows that he had made for Mordecai. So you see, like when Mordecai is just being righteous, right? God's taking care of him in all this. God's working things out. So because the king really liked Esther, obviously it's his queen, he makes Mordecai in place of Haman, because Haman's dead now, so now he needs somebody to lead those people. He puts Mordecai in place. Now this is when Esther says, well, what are we gonna do about the law? What are we gonna do about the law that you made on that day, on the 13th of December, right? The 12th month, where all the Jews are going to be killed. And the king's like, well, I'm not too sure what we're going to do, because once I create a law, I can't change it. I can't remove that law, because that was one of the laws of the per Persians and Medes, that once you create a law, you can't remove it. You can't change that law. But they came up with an idea. Instead of changing the law and removing it, he said, you know what? What we can do is we can write a new law. Instead of changing or removing the law, we're going to write a new law to overwrite 
the old law. So what did they write? They wrote a new law, signed it with the king's seal, and you know what that new law said? Because remember, the first law was on a day all the Jews are going to be killed. The new law said, hey, you know what? On the, 12, on the, on the 13th of December, when, the, when people are trying to kill the Jews, the new law said, hey, the Jews can defend themselves. The Jews are allowed to fight back if somebody tries to kill them. So that message then went out to all the Jews to say, hey, on this day when people try and kill you, you can defend yourself. So everyone was happy that this law, new law was written. They were ready that when that day came, they could defend themselves. So when that day came and all the enemies of the Jews tried to kill the Jews, the Jews were ready to defend themselves against this attack, and they won, right? They prevailed, they defended themselves. And that's how the story ends. And on the 13th, there was this battle where they defended themselves, so they celebrated. On the 14th and the 15th of that month, they made it a day where they would celebrate from that day onwards. So isn't that an interesting story about Esther? So how does it tie in to the gospel? Right, there's many lessons from Esther where we can learn about Jesus. One way we can learn about it is remember when Esther went in to see the king. She interceded on behalf of the people. Doing that, she saved her people. Right, so that's a picture of Jesus. But not only, not only that, you remember the law that was set to kill all the Jews? That's like us. When we sin, there's a law in place that we need to be punished for our sins. The wages of sin is death. And that law cannot be changed. It cannot be removed. If we've sinned, and all of us have, we need to suffer a punishment that is coming. But you know what? Jesus wrote a new law. The law of the New Testament, that we can be saved by grace, overwriting the consequences of the first law. So you see how there's that lesson there that we learned from Esther, that there's the law of sin, the commandments of the Old Testament that cannot be changed, We've broken that law, but if we believe on Jesus, then we can accept the new law that comes and defend ourselves from that judgment. 